Uh, hello, uh, this is Siang 334. Uh, so this is uh, one of our offline recordings. Uh, uh, and later, hopefully, we could do some uh, interactive session uh, uh, all together. Uh, so, uh, so far, we have uh, talked about the synchronization primitives, basically. Uh, LUX, how to implement LUX, uh, the uh, semaphores, which are basically a counting version of a LUX. That means you can have a number of resources uh, given in the semaphore, and everyone trying to get a resource will uh, wait for it. So, preserve a resource, in other words. So, semaphores cannot go beyond zero, so you cannot make it minus one. So you have to block. In this way, we can use it as a synchronization primitive. Uh, locks, on the other hand, are used for protecting critical regions. And also, in the same logic with semaphores, they can be used for synchronization purposes as well. And the monitors, on the other hand, uh, we implement it as an object. And monitors, by default, by library, by implementation, gives you the chance of uh, mutual exclusion. And then uh, you can. Uh, add more logic into your methods of your monitor so that uh, you can provide uh, probably richer way of uh, synchronization. Uh, and we have condition variables that allow you to uh, block inside of a monitor. So synchronization has communication purposes and uh, mutual exclusion, exclusion, exclusion purposes. Now we have another problem. In a world of synchronization, in a world of locking, mutual exclusion, you have uh, one important issue that we call the deadlocks. So today we are going to talk about uh, deadlocks. So before going into deadlocks, we are uh, going to talk about the uh, preemption. Uh, if you remember, uh, the preemption uh, is, uh, actually we talked this uh, in the uh, user level uh, threads as well. So if you give a resource, especially CPU to a thread, a uh, thread can voluntarily give up that resource, the CPU, or it can be another resource like lock and so on, or you can take it forcefully. And this forceful taking is called preemption. Uh, the uh, CPUs usually in the scheduling uh, is a preemptible source resource. Uh, however, uh, the others like mutexes, locks, uh, etc can be non-preemptive. So basically, by default, you uh, once a thread is holding a resource, you don't take it from uh, the thread owning it. Uh, so uh, if you forcefully take a lock away from the thread, thread will stay in the critical region. And they it tries to make operations in that critical region. So it will invalidate your semantics of your uh, mutual exclusion and critical region or whatever you are after uh, for your synchronization problem. So we don't usually cramp the lux. But this comes with a typical problem, the deadlock problem. And the deadlock problem, uh, threads are not Threads are not alone, and there is no single uh, resource they are uh, blocking on. And if we have some sort of uh, cyclic dependency, like here in this illustration, this car waits for this one, this one waits for this one, and this one waits for the other one. So uh, if we do so, uh, we can have uh, this uh, critical way of uh, depend, uh, 
locking forever. So this will end up in blocking forever. And that lock is uh, the way the mutexes or resources and the threads are uh, going after the locks and critical regions so that they block forever. They wait forever. A typical case is this one. Uh, so a thread is holding this mutex one and it is waiting for another mutex. And there is another thread holding this one and waiting for this. And this way, this one will wait this mutex two and thread one will, uh, sorry, uh, this thread, hold thread two, hold thread two, thread one, hold thread one. And thread two waits for thread two and thread two waits for thread one forever because they are in the state for blocking and since they are blocking, they cannot release uh, the threads they hold. And in this manner, we will have some cyclic dependency. Uh, so this uh, blocking forever is called deadlock, but you shouldn't uh, confuse it with the starvation. Uh, deadlock is a way of starvation because they cannot get uh, enough of the uh, CPU. Uh, but starvation is not deadlock. Starvation is when you have a chance to get a resource or CPU, but you cannot because of there is too much, there are too much threats uh, waiting for it, or uh, there is a competition for them. Uh, so, uh, starvation has a solution. By any chance, once in a million, you can get that. And this is the difference between a deadlock. Once you enter a deadlock, there is no way out of it. In the usual sense, of course. Of course, it may be killed, it may be blocked. User may press some halt key and so on. We can have other solutions. Uh, and how we deal with deadlocks. There are different ways. Uh, we can make sure that system never enters that state. So operating system is uh, like a, a governor of the resources, all the threads, all the mutexes and so on. He will watch all of them and it will not allow you to enter that. So the cyclic dependency somehow uh, avoided by the accounting of the operating system. Uh, the second option uh, is you allow system to enter deadlock, but when there is a deadlock, you detect it and you solve it by stopping one of the threads, for example, or uh, returning errors for one of the uh, blocking weights of the threads. And the Third option is actually an interesting option, which is uh, ignoring it, basically. Do not do just anything about that. And this looks like not a uh, solution, but uh, it's a common solution by operating systems, interestingly, uh, because it's too expensive. Making the first one, uh, avoiding that luck or Detecting that luck is expensive, and operating systems uh, usually do this. If you are writing this code, if you are programming this, you have to make sure that you program it correctly, that it will not enter that luck. It's your responsibility. Keep your house clean. It's some uh, philosophy like that. And it's very easy to implement. Do nothing. Uh, so, in this chapter, we are going to uh, talk about uh, ways of uh, achieving this. Sorry, I lose my... Uh, one of the uh, well-known example for deadlocks is this one. It is called Dining Philosophers. So, the uh, problem it's an artificial problem, but it's a good problem to illustrate the deadlock case. 
there are as many philosophers you like around the table. In this case, it is uh, five of them. And there are chopsticks on the table, but for five philosophers, there are five chopsticks. And a philosopher needs, to, uh, needs two chopsticks to eat. So that means uh, Karl Marx here is going to use this one and this one to eat. Uh, and this one has to use this one and this one, and Aristo has to use this one and this one. So uh, it is a little bit unhygienic, but they have to share chopsticks, okay? Uh, so in a regular scenario, if you consider all of the philosophers as threats, uh, they hold two resources to eat and then release it. And this one holds two resources to eat and releases, release them. And in this way, you can have uh, this uh, uh, dinner uh, going on. But the problem here is, if you write your algorithm so that all of the philosophers first take left chopstick, then right chopstick and eat, you may end up in a case that, because our computers are fast, you can, all of the philosophers, get the left chopstick and waiting for the other. There is no chopstick left on the table and all of the philosophers are waiting for a chopstick. And they are going to wait forever and they are going to starve. Uh, so this uh, problem, is a way of cyclic dependency. All of them is holding one, waiting for another, holding one, waiting for another, holding one, and waiting for, for another. And it will go forever. So uh, let me show you an example of this. It is on uh, GitLab resources. Uh, there is a deadlock directory here. And there are examples of uh, this deadlocks. Let me show you my source code. Okay, so this is our dynamic philosopher example. So basically uh, I created as many philosophers I like, as it is here. Uh, so in this loop here, I create five uh, philosophers. Uh, sorry, this is uh, for mutex initialization. In Ptred library, we have to initialize our mutexes. I uh, create a mutex per chopstick. Uh, by the way, uh, in the source code, I'm referring them as forks, but the idea is the same fork, chopstick, same thing. Uh, so I create four chopsticks, and for each philosopher, I create uh, here, I create a, a philosopher thread with philosopher function and each philosopher thread gets its ID. So an integer they are going to get. And then my philosopher loop is basically this one. As you can see, a philosopher typically gets his uh, ID here, which is I, and his left chopstick is uh, by the way, mutexes are global, so they can access all of the threads, access the same uh, mutex variable in an array. Left is, if it is the leftmost philosopher, it is the fourth fork, fourth chopstick. If it is otherwise, it is uh, I minus one chopstick. So one will get zero, two will get one, and so on. Right chopstick is uh, basically I chopstick. In this way, each of the philosopher will get his left and right chopsticks. Then, 
we will have uh, this loop and in a loop they do uh, think for a while so this is the thinking part you sleep they will they are philosophers by the way they sleep uh, think for a while take the left chopstick this line take the right chopstick and then they report they are eating and eat for a while it is 10,000 milliseconds in this example and they finish eating they leave left and right down and this go like 100 times now let us see what's going to happen in this code let me compile it okay okay all of our philosophers peacefully finish their dinners uh, and you will see no two adjacent philosopher eating together okay one four one four zero two so as you can see in this code we make sure that no adjacent philosophers eat together what happened to the deadlock so uh, we didn't observe it, but it doesn't uh, guarantee that we will not observe it. So it doesn't make sure we will not observe it. So in order to uh, observe it, we should probably get rid of those. Sleep times. Since they don't sleep, we will have a better chance of observing it. Uh, in different scenarios, you can reduce the number of uh, philosophers, etc., to observe it. But I believe uh, this one will be sufficient. Our machines are uh, fast enough to hit a uh, deadlock in this case. So now let us observe our deadlock. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, no. So since the loop is too uh, small, probably we want to observe that because of this. Let us introduce more cycles. Okay, I have an extra thing to do for this. Probably my machine is too fast for this. So let us reduce the number of philosophers to three. So we will have only three philosophers. This uh, segmentation fault is about the uh, locking. Okay. I can show it in uh, another. Uh, machine So apparently I couldn't get it.
Okay, so you see here in this machine, we could uh, observe uh, the deadlocks at last. So it is not easy uh, to observe it, but uh, if you consider your code will work long, longer times and consume too much CPU, uh, probably you will observe it uh, more uh, easier than this. Uh, let us get it again. So if you try uh, more times, you will see it's uh, working. Uh, now, let us go back to our slides again. So what are the reasons for deadlock? What are uh, the mechanisms uh, behind the deadlock? So we have uh, this uh, five, uh, sorry, four characteristics uh, for a deadlock. Uh, otherwise, you will not observe a deadlock in a uh, concurrent program. First thing is mutual exclusion. So you should have uh, some sort of resource, a critical region or some uh, area that only one uh, process is allowed in. Uh, like our chopsticks. Hold down weight. Uh, a process holds at least one resource waiting for another. So if you only hold one resource at a time, the deadlock will not occur. In our dining philosopher case, we have left chopstick is hold, right is wait, waited. No preemption. So we don't preempt, so we wait forever. If we start waiting, we start, wait forever and no one Prems us. In this case, deadlock will occur. If one of the philosophers gets some error after some timeout, for example, uh, and restarts the uh, dining, you will not uh, you will not observe this uh, preemption case. Uh, sorry, deadlock case. And the last one, uh, which is uh, quite interesting for us as well, because we will use this in uh, deadlock avoidance and uh, detection. Circular weight, we should have some sort of cycle. If there is no cycle, eventually one of the threads will release the resource and it will just go away. In order to wait forever, we should have a cycle so that no thread is going to be able to uh, unblock and release some resource. So in our dining philosopher case, we have this cycle, zero, depends on one, one depends on two, two depends on three, three depends on four, four depends on zero. And it is our uh, last piece of our cycle. Uh, so in order to prevent that, we can do violate one of those four uh, cases. Uh, we can use shareable resources. Uh, I, I don't get an example for this, but uh, if you can do, for example, you can share chopsticks. I don't know, break it twice in two and so on. But if you don't have mutual exclusion in your code, your code will work. Hold on, wait. Um, uh, you must guarantee that there is no hold on, wait. So you allow only one resource is hold at a time. So assume you have a thread library, which allows you only lock one resource. In order to lock another resource, you have to release the previous one. In this way, you are only allowed to use one of them. Uh, of course, uh, in some problems, it is not possible. So our, for example, our semantics of uh, dining philosopher doesn't allow you that. No preemption. So we can have, uh, we can violate this by uh, preemption. We can put, for example, timeouts in holes. You can block uh, for resource at most one second. After a second, you should try it again. Uh, 
by resourcing. So you try not hold you not retry holding, but release all of the resources again, and you go back to our philosophical loop, for example. And the last one is the circular weight. If you violate the cycle, so if your hold and weight patterns of multiple threads construct a cycle, you break it, but not by not allowing it. And the base, uh, best way of doing that is give them an order. So give them a number, for example. You cannot hold a, a number uh, X and try to wait for uh, another resource which is smaller than X. You have to go in incremental order, for example. Uh, in our dining philosopher case, the philosopher getting uh, four and waiting for holding four and uh, waiting for zero will violate this uh, total order principle. So it should go zero than four, for example. So uh, this ordering can be given as uh, this one, uh, give each of them an order and try to uh, not to break this order by following this pattern. Uh, so we are not allowed to do down 743 and then 742. We have to correct this ordering. So let us solve this uh, problem. I have a couple of uh, solutions in the uh, source code. So let us go back to our solutions. Actually, this one is faster, so let me show you in this code. So, uh, this is the multi-process version of the same thing, uh, just to give you an idea. This is how you do this with semaphores. Uh, you can check for this uh, source code if, uh, if you wonder how it is done in multi-process case. Uh, now let us see a couple of uh, solutions. So let us first uh, see our no hold and wait case. Uh, this is a This is a special case uh, with IPC uh, semaphores. Uh, this is provided by library. Uh, you don't hold down wait, but you uh, wait for multiple instances of semaphores. Uh, this is uh, provided by uh, a special uh, library, uh, System 5 IPC. So we have arrays of semaphores and uh, you can block in uh, multiple semaphores at once. So if you look into your uh, philosopher code, you say, I would like to block on the left and right semaphore at once. So this line here, this semaphore operation here, is an atomic operation doing both of them or not. So it doesn't hold and wait. It either gets two of them at once or not. This is provided by library. And this will violate this hold and wait case. No one holds anything before holding both of them. So it is a good solution. So this is Mecos. If it is going to work, I don't know, but this it's working. So in this case, they are uh, holding both of them or not. So even if, even if I comment these out, uh, sleeps out. Wait. 
we will see no uh, deadlock because they are holding both or not. So this is our first uh, solution. Uh, the uh, second uh, solution is actually it is not working in macOS uh, because it's a Linux uh, feature. Uh, and it is no preempt version. Can I violate? Can I not violate, but break the deadlock by no uh, preempt condition? So this is a preempting code. So instead of uh, using Uh, just two lines of code with left lock, right lock. I have this lock. Uh, I have this. I lock left chopstick as usual. And for right chopstick, I do this. I have a timeout value. And this is the uh, timeout version of Mutex. It is called timed lock. And I specify this timeout, which is one second. Uh, if for a second, the philosopher cannot get the right chopstick, it goes here. If it can, it will go break out of this loop and start eating. Otherwise, it is going to release the left chopstick, go back to the beginning of the loop, get left again and right. And this is another way of Avoiding the rest is the same, and if you follow this, you will observe no uh, deadlock. Sometimes, if you try this code too many times without sleeps, you will see one second of a deadlock, and one of the philosophers will be preempted and go out of the uh, deadlock. And last uh, but not least, uh, the most interesting one is this is no cyclic dependency version. Basically, this is uh, you can have a easier version just between this four and zero. You order their IDs, and based on this order, you uh, lock the uh, chopstick so you what you need to do is left and right ids you order them left will be always smaller than right or the first one will be always smaller than second one so basically you can write this code if that is less than right first get left then right otherwise First right, then left. And this is going to break the cycle. And even if you try this many times, uh, you will not see uh, any uh, deadlocks. Uh, what about the uh, original version without I change it so this is only uh, making a uh, left philosopher uh, switch this position uh, sorry uh, leftmost philosopher switches location instead you can do this one If philosopher ID is uh, odd, you go left, right. If it is even, you go right, left. So that one of them will left, right. The next one will right, left. So they are going to block on the same one. So they there will be no cycle again because they are uh, using arbitrarily uh, switching left and right. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is this is a solution by Knut. So the Knut uh, proposed this solution to get rid of a uh, deadlock problem. Okay. 
Now, uh, let us go back to our slides, if I can. Okay. So these are our uh, solutions. So that look uh, avoidance is uh, avoiding that luck by uh, interfering with all this hold and wait conditions, which needs some accounting of the uh, list of locks currently held by a thread process and uh, control all of the uh, assignment of a lock to a thread. And during this, keep track of uh, avoiding that lock. So, uh, so we need this uh, dynamic examination of resource allocation uh, and in this way we uh, allocate resources ba based on uh, deadlock uh, control. So this is our uh, system model for deadlock avoidance. So we will have resource types R1, R2, RM, uh, CPU, memory, audio devices, whatever you like. And each resource has uh, WI instances, like here. Uh, so RI has WI instances, sorry. Has WI instances. Uh, so you can have two printers, two hard disks, or uh, different slots of memory or CPU, you can have different scenarios for that. Uh, and each process has this three basic sequence of operations. Request it, when you get it, you start using it and you release it. So this is basically locking it, using it and unlocking it for uh, our lock case. Okay, so now uh, in this case, what we can do is we can keep track of a, a resource allocation graph. So given the uh, set of resources and number of uh, each, uh, number of those resources uh, and the processes, we can keep a resource allocation strategy with a graph like this. So each resources are shown by a rectangle and within that re rectangle, each dot here denotes uh, an instance of that resource. And each process is, each process is a, a circle. And uh, when uh, there is an arrow, uh, from resource to process, it means it is allocated. So currently P1 is holding a resource of two, second resource of R2. If we have an arrow from process to the resource, it means it is not allocated yet, but it is uh, requested by the process. So if process makes a request and it is available, the arrow gets in the other direction, it changes the direction and the resource is allocated to the uh, process. Now, this uh, case, this denotation will give us cycles actually. And if you look into the cycles, uh, it will tell you there is a deadlock but it will not guarantee you that there is a deadlock. A cycle may be a deadlock. And if there is a deadlock, there should be a cycle. But reverse is not true. Uh, so basically, in this system, uh, P1 demands R1. R1 is currently only instance of R1 is currently held by P2. And R2 is assigned to P1, another instance is assigned to P2, and so on. 
Now, if you look into this graph, you will see a cycle. The cycle is between those. Sorry about this. Okay, so these are our edges of our cycle. But this doesn't uh, make sure that there is a deadlock. Because let, let us first uh, think about why uh, we are talking about the cycle in this case. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, P2 holds R2, P3 requests R2, P2 demands R3, and R3 is hold by P3. So that's why we have this cycle. However, since there are two resources of R2, two instances of R2, P1 can release it. And if P1 releases it, P3 can get it. And we can break our cycle. Now let us look into P1. P1 is currently waiting for R1. And R1 is held by P2. P2 is blocked for R3. So actually there is a deadlock here, but it doesn't have to be. If we have just a single change, you can end up in a case, there is a cycle, but there is no deadlock like this one. Uh, in this case, we have a cycle here. So this is our cycle, basically. Uh, however, P2 can break the cycle by releasing one instance of R1, or P4 can release it, uh, PR2, and it will break the cycle. So uh, the existence of a cycle doesn't necessarily imply that luck. So, however, you can use rest, the remaining or the reverse of the relation. If there is a deadlock, there is a cycle. So this will make, uh, this will give us this. A little bit too restrictive, but if we can avoid cycles, we avoid deadlocks. Okay. So uh, when we talk about the safe states of a system, uh, the uh, deadlock is our unsafe state. And in, in our safe state, there is no deadlock. Uh, and what we can do is, we will not allow our uh, system from a safe st state to the unsafe state. So we will not allow this transition. Uh, if you avoid cycle, we can do that. But as you can see, cycle doesn't imply the deadlock. So it will be too restrictive. So sometimes we are going to avoid safe states which have cycles. But uh, we can uh, do with it. So what we need to do is uh, we will have uh, all resources and their uh, safe states uh, and we will not allow this uh, bro uh, breaking of a safe state. So uh, together with safe states, we can make a definition of safe sequences. And safe sequences is like you let all of the processes go and eventually they release uh, all the resources they have. And at the end, as a result, all of your threats, all, all of your processes can ter terminate or not. So in some ordering, 
process two will release all of the resources and it can go process three, process four. And in this sequence, they are going to uh, always in this uh, safe region. So we are going to let processor two uh, get the request. System will be on the safe state. Then process three will get its resources. System will be on the safe state and so on. If we can find such a safe sequence, we will always remain in the safe. And, uh, and if there is a safe sequence, our system is safe and the next operation will be a safe operation. Uh, and the idea is uh, scratch here. So uh, uh, so uh, for each PI, we have resources. PI can still request uh, by currently available resources and uh, all the PJ, which J is less than I, uh, can release the resources so that PI can continue. In this way, we always, uh, all P's with less than I can release the resources so I can continue. In this way, we keep in this safe state. Uh, And when I terminate, I plus one can obtain all of the resources and so on. It will go like that. Uh, so this is our resource allocation graph for uh, dining uh, philosopher example. So the uh, arrows here are the resources that philosophers are interested in. Not holding yet, but interested in. The P4 may request this R0, R1, and R4, and P1 can request this one and this one. So this assumes that we know uh, each process uh, and what they are going to require. So they didn't, they, don't, they didn't request it yet, but they may request, we will have that listing, which is not a real life thing actually, but assume we have that. Assume we know in advance that all processes and what they may request in advance. And these are all these request arrows. And there is no cycle in this graph yet. Now we give, uh, R to process one, still there is no cycle. And then we are uh, examining uh, the deadlock case in the dining philosopher. Everyone getting the left and waiting for the right one. So uh, P2 has requested the right in this case, but chopstick and P3 and then Still, I grant it because there is no cycle. When uh, P4 requested this R, it will form a cycle. So I am, I am going to reject it. I tell, I will not give you that. I will not let you block for that. So you will get an error. So you have to retry. In this case, the deadlock will be avoided. And the, Dining philosopher case. So this is uh, the uh, resource allocation graph used as a deadlock avoidance. Okay. If you have a cycle detection algorithm in your graph and you know in advance which thread may request which uh, resources, you can keep track of such a graph and you can detect, the, and detect and avoid the cycles. So uh, this is 
the planning philosophy for implementation. We already have it. And the IDs and so on. Actually, I have shown you this, uh, the states and so on. Uh, so in uh, resource allocation graph, uh, we have uh, the uh, assumption of uh, we have only one resource at a time. So uh, one, only one instance of a resource. So we don't know if, uh, or we don't have processes require more than one resource. So in some uh, real life scenarios, we may have this. I need three cores of CPU, two hard disks and five GPU units. You can do this in cluster like environments in order to have your algorithm work. In a cluster, you may need 40 cores, uh, one uh, GPU units, and two terabytes of hard disk. So uh, in this case, the allocation graph will not work because you need more than one instance of a resource. So cycle detection will not work. Uh, for this, we have another algorithm, which, call, which, which we call Banker's algorithm. In the Banker's algorithm, uh, we know uh, the maximum cases in advance by all of the uh, processes. They declare how many instances of each resource they are eventually going to need. And the banker algorithm, uh, actually it is uh, Uh, coming from the real life bankers loaning money, getting money, uh, previously loaned money from other customers and loan new money, uh, take, can take care of that. In this case, uh, what we have is we have uh, for each uh, thread, uh, we know in advance all of these maximums. And our system has the sources, resources, the instance of resources fixed, and we know each process. Uh, and from this, we always keep ourselves in a safe state. And as long as there is a safe sequence, we continue giving away the resources. So this is uh, our example. Uh, there are five processes from P1 to P5. There are three resource types. And currently in our system, we have uh, 10 of A, 5 of B, and 7 of C's. And each process declared in advance that how uh, they are going to need uh, for each uh, resource, how many of each resources they need. Uh, at maximum, at any instance of computation, they may need only uh, half of these, but at the end, they are going to use all of them. They declared. Uh, so this banker's algorithm uh, depends on uh, or assume, uh, assumes that each process will eventually finish and release all of the resources. So they are going to be uh, given back to the system. So now in order to uh, uh, see trace the banker's algorithm, we keep track of this information. How many of resources currently each process is holding? So at max, it is going to need five, five, 753, and currently it is 010. Zero, zero. And 322, two, currently 200, zero, zero, and it will go like that. Uh, and of course, this uh, sum of the allocated cannot go larger than available one in the system. So currently, if you sum all of them, you will have seven and three is available. Two, three is available. Five out of seven, two is available. Then you can also uh, calculate this needs. This is further need of the process in the future. Okay. So now, if you look into these matrices, 
you can calculate if there is a safe sequence. And this uh, safe sequence is, if I let one of the process execute and finish, so they allocate all of the information they have, I can start another one and it can finish, release, finish release, release release, and at the end you are going to have all of the um, threads finish. So this one, for example, in this sequence, P2 is going to release all of the resources. Uh, so it is going to get all of the needs, okay. P2 is given away all of the needs. So this one, two, two should be smaller than this. It is given and it releases all of them. So at the end, one, two, two can be given. So it will be two, one, zero. And then it releases all of them. So it will be five, four, two. With this five, four, two, I can uh, provide needs of another. Then it's going to execute and deallocate. From the remaining available, I can give needs of the another and so on. Uh, so this is a safe state. So I can enter this state from wherever I have, I can enter this state safely. So assume here at this state, two, three, zero, uh, P2 requests one, zero, two. Okay, P2 requests one, zero, two. Uh, so it was going to be one, zero, two from the previous state. One, zero, two will enter you in two, three, zero state. And currently it will be uh, three, zero, two, two, zero, zero, done, zero, three, zero, two. And now I look into this table and if there is a safe sequence, yes, P2, 4, 5, P1, P3 is still possible. So uh, I can give, uh, actually there is an error in this. Uh, sorry. Okay. Let us uh, correct that in the annotation. So I, basically uh, this should be, since I gave two of them, this should be zero. Not two, but zero. Okay. So now it is one, two, zero. And there is a safe sequence. I can start P2. I can fulfill the requirements of P2. Then it releases everything. It will be uh, five, five, two. With 552, I can find another, another, and it will go like that. So then, uh, after these, uh, So after this, assume P5 requests 332, okay. Uh, but 332 is not available, okay. 332 is not available, so I'm going to let him wait, okay. Uh, P1 requests 
0 to 0, it is available. So I can give 0 to 0 to P1. But what happens? In that case, now I will have new values will be uh, 2, 1, 0. Now with 2, 1, 0, do I have a safe sequence? And this is the question. And if you look here, Sorry, I'm losing my mouse. Um, 210, 210, no. 210, no. 210, no. 210, no. 210, no. 210. So 210 cannot fulfill any of this. So this is not a safe sequence. So I'm going to reject this. I'm going to reject the previous one. Since it is not available, I'm going to reject this because the uh, position I go after giving away is not safe. So I basically reject this, okay? Uh, so it will go this way. So I am going to uh, start from this initial state. And as long as I am in the safe, I am going to uh, accept the uh, requests and if it's not safe i'm going to reject it uh, so i reject 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 i reject many requests and eventually the p2 at least which is uh, my safe sequence is going to finish and when it finishes i can start accepting the others resources okay uh, so in this state for example, if P2 goes away, it is going to give all of the uh, resources back. So I will have 532. With 532, I can fulfill P5 requests and so on. And it is going to be safe and so on. Uh, so let us look into uh, the dining philosophers. With Banker's algorithm. Of course, Banker's algorithm is uh, for multiple instances of resources uh, needed, but still we can use it with Dynamic Philosopher as well. And this is my um, table for Banker's algorithm. Each philosopher needs left and right chopstick, P2, left and right, P2, left and right, left and right. And in this case, left is this one, right is this one. It is like that. And I'm going to go for safe states. I'm going to give uh, all philosophers their, their chopsticks like that. And I'm trying to enter the deadlock. Now, this is a safe state. Why it is a safe state? Because in the available chopsticks, still I can fulfill one of them. I can fulfill P4 so that 43215 is a feasible case. Okay. Since this is safe state, I allow this. I allow my uh, algorithm to go into the state. But if I let this left chopstick request come from this, I will end up in this. No chopstick is available. And all of them are still demanding extra resource. So this is not safe. So I'm going to reject it. And this is how I can uh, avoid the deadlock scenario by the library of uh, philosopher, dining philosopher problem. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, about uh, deadlock. Uh, 
uh, hopefully we will make an interactive session uh, during the week uh, so we can have more examples on this. Uh, thank you very much for watching. See you in the interactive class.